Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. It's episode 183, and today I'm going to bring you kind of a fun conversation, not quite an interview, that I had with Soke Michael De Pasquale Jr. at the 2017 Martial Arts Symposium. I'll tell you more about what we did and why in just a moment. First, though, I want to welcome you to the show. If you're new, thanks for tuning in. You can check out all of our past episodes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And if it's time for some new sparring gear, or maybe you want to pick up a shirt, or check out some of the other great stuff that we have going on our online store, that's at whistlekick.com. If my voice is new to you, or maybe you've suffered dementia in the last week, <laughs> my name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm the host here on the show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick, and I'm a passionate martial artist, and I thank you for spending some time here on the show with me today. You might notice my voice is a little different than normal. I was teaching some classes last night and doing a lot of uh, enthusiastic, high-volume encouragement. That's kind of code for yelling. I get pretty into my teaching, whether it's CrossFit or martial arts or gymnastics, and I get kind of animated. There's a fair amount of yelling going on. Not in a bad way. It's encouraging yelling. I just, I just get loud. <laughs> you won't hear any of that on the episode, though. We recorded this a couple of weeks ago at the 2017 Martial Arts Symposium. If you've checked out episode 181 with Hanchi Bruce Jutnik and Bill Superfoot Wallace, it was that same area, that same weekend that we recorded. And Soki de Pasquale is someone that I've really wanted to talk to and we've tried to coordinate and it just, it hasn't worked out. And it's not because I don't want him or, or he hasn't wanted to come on the show. It's just, you know, busy. He's a very busy man and we just haven't been able to make it work. So when we had this opportunity, I said, you know, let's, let's do this. It's not going to be perfect. The audio quality is not perfect. It's good. And we've cleaned it up a lot. You're not going to hear a typical interview. I didn't have paper. I didn't have notes. We just talked. And honestly, he did much of the talking more than normally on, on one of our sort of interview style shows. I just asked him to tell some stories. Tell us some of the stuff that's happened that people may not know about you. And that's really what we did for, I think it was about 45 minutes or so. And it was a lot of fun. He tells some great stories. He's been around for a long time, knows a lot of people. And I think you're going to enjoy this. If you're not familiar with Soke Michael De Pasquale Jr., he's kind of a legend. I shouldn't say kind of. He is a legend in the world of jiu-jitsu. His father was an early pioneer in jiu-jitsu in the United States. And who better to learn from than your father when he basically creates something? So that's what we have today. We have a conversation with Soke, Michael De Pasquale Jr., and I hope you enjoy it. You know, I wanted to hear some stories. I still want to, because we don't quite have the time for it's okay. the what full interview, yeah. right? So I, th I thought, what could we do that would be a little different, but still fun and still, you know, that well, people would want to hear? Well, several different things. I mean, my magazines, I, did, I built the first martial internet site in the world with America Online as my partner. People don't even know that. T t well, Tell me about that then, because that, that's not, I mean, I've heard a lot of things yeah, well, about you, but that's one I have one a lot, have a lot of different of. stories I can tell. You know, like the story last night with the kid with the book. You saw that, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. I mean, 40 years, a guy got a book, you know, that was my first book I wrote for Simon Schuster. Right. What was that book about? It was Monarch Illustrated Guide to Jiu-Jitsu, and what it was was a book that, and ironically, it was kind of funny how it happened, because the guy who was the CEO... I actually was the a CPA for Golf and Western. Golf and Western bought Simon & Schuster back in the 70s. Okay. And I was teaching his son. All right. And when I was teaching his son, I used to call him Tank, the kid, because he was big. Uh, one day he came up to me and said, listen, we're coming up with a line of books called Monarch Illustrated Guide to Boating, Fishing, Camping. Yeah, I remember that series. And people don't realize that Monarch, was, Monarch Notes was his biggest Cliff Notes back then. Okay. They were the same thing as Cliff Notes, yeah. except that Simon Schuster produced them. So he asked me, I'd like to do a specialty book with you. And um, he said, propose it. So I proposed it. Next thing I know, I had a specialty book. It was the first jiu-jitsu book by a major motion, uh, by a major, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, book co publishing company. Sure. And um, it came out, and I did a bunch of uh, demonstrations at different places, like uh, malls and bookstores and demonstrations with the book yeah. and um from there i wrote six books with them so and then i wrote two books with tuttle 
Street Boy City for all, women. All on jiu-jitsu? No. Okay. No, no. Second book I wrote with them was called Woman's Guide to Self-Defense. Okay. And then I wrote Martial Arts for Young Athletes. Then I wrote another book called uh, Learn the Martial Arts in Eight Weeks. It was basically, I didn't like the title, but uh, <laughs> it was a beginner's book. You didn't pick that title, I'm guessing. No, not at all. They that did. sounds like a publisher upset. They want to master the martial arts in eight weeks. I oh. said, you kidding me? Not with your well, name I ended on up it. with, no, I didn't like it. I didn't like that title, but I did it. And then another one I did with Hamlin, which was a subsidiary in England of Simon & Schuster, which was uh, The Complete Guide to Martial Arts, was that name of that book. Mm. And then I went on and I, I did publish my own stuff. I published a book called The Who's Who in the Martial Art Elite. It was a... One of the first Who's Who books after Bob Wall did his first, he yeah. did a book called Who's Who in the Martial League, which my father was in, the first one, and a handful of people. And then the second, the second book that he wrote, I was in that one. He did a second edition. But, um, you know, it snowballed from there. When I did that, what happened was I ended up, very interesting, martial arts came first. I was competing. I did a bunch of. I was a, won the East Coast Championship. A lot of people don't know that in karate. I competed. I won. I qualified for the Pan American Team Trials. Really? I fought in the first kickboxing league on the East Coast, which was Gary Alexander's kickboxing league. Okay. And uh, I trained with uh, you know a lot of people like Siren Gano for that, and a bunch of. I used to train all over the place because my father. Right. My father was an icon. He had people come in all the time. Jerry Thompson, who was the head of the AAU at the time. Yeah. Of the karate, AAU karate was his. My father, you know, a lot of people used to come to the dojo, lots of people. And then um, when that happened, I uh, after the books uh, came along, I had an opportunity to, to publish a magazine mm-hmm. because I met a guy that was publishing magazines at the time. And he he actually was one of the publishers. Him and his brother were the publishers of Action Black Belt magazine, Masters of the Martial Arts. I met him at a health spa. I was doing an anti-rape program. And he was there, and he said, listen, I want to talk to you about, you know, because he knew I had a book, which right. was Woman's Guide to Self-Defense. And my other. So it snowballed. He, he sat me down, and uh, he said, listen, I'd like to do a magazine with you. So he was with Warner Publishing, mm-hmm. distributed magazines. He had a whole bunch of different magazines him and his brother owned. Uh, so uh, I ended up sitting, and it's, it's great stories because – the magazine was, I would produce the magazine. I used a lot of the people I knew. We started, I would have to get all the pictures and have the articles typed up because yeah. back then it wasn't what, computers. What year is this? This is 1985. Okay. And um, I would meet him in the diner. And we would sit there because I knew the owner of the diner. So we'd sit there for hours putting this magazine kind together. Little, well, no, he would do that hours. in his studio at home because, you know, he had a, he had his own publishing studio at home. I would do the covers. I would get people. And then we, we designed it together. Even I even was one of the first. I did ads to sell equipment and stuff. And he was the first one to show me that. We would get a bunch of equipment from a company called Cam at the time, a friend of mine owned. And, you know, I had like eight pages of, you know, equipment that I was selling through Cam. And then we would cut a deal with him. I did a lot of that. I was smart enough and when I went on to really become... I mean, my own publisher, pretty much, or editor and publisher. Because after I finished, I did a magazine called Combat Karate. Chuck Norris was on the first cover. And then I did a magazine called Ninja the Deadly Warrior. So I published that magazine. They both were distributed by Warner. They did very well, actually. And um, Sho Kazuki was on the first cover. He was a good friend of mine. I knew Sho. Oh, cool. Yeah, he actually I started a thing called NAD, Ninjas Against Drugs. I used to always come up with ideas. And I had him as a spokesperson. So each issue... I would have members join NAD, Ninjas Against Drugs, and I would ask Shoke a bunch of questions about, you know, what he was doing and he and answering the questions, and we would, you know, do a campaign. I started at that time, I, in 1982, I had an organization, it was a non-profit tax-exempt organization, still have it, called FUMA, Federation of United Martial Arts Crusade Against Crime and Drugs. It was a non-profit. That's where, I, that, that helped me grow a lot because I was able to get on, I was the first one on the East Coast to do TV. I did Regis Philbin the third day he was on the air. So I did what, an, what year was that? That That's, was 1984. Yeah. Wow. And I did an anti-rape program with him, and I went on to do you know, five, six TV shows with him. And I'll tell you a great story. Uh, I'm, on, uh, I'm on his uh, cable show, 
It was the Regis Philbin show. Yeah. And I'm standing there, and this is like the third show I did with him. Because I did, I went back and forth. I did the the morning show, mm-hmm. which was on NBC, I believe. Uh, and then I would do this cable show. He called me up and he'd say, listen, I want you to come over and do my cable show. You know, uh, I have somebody missing. It was uh, really funny because uh, I remember Don uh, Adams was on there with me on one segment yeah. from Get Smart. And uh, I, I did a bunch of things. And we were, we're in there one day. I think it was the second time I was on the air with him there. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm even screaming. We hear, I hear screaming. I'm in the green room. And we run into the monitor room, and everybody's screaming, looking at the monitors. There's like 15, 10, 15 monitors. And the shuttle blew up. Oh. Something you never forget. So we're yeah. sitting there. Me and Regis are standing next to one another. And yeah. there's a shuttle on every one of the screens blowing up. And it was a real tragedy because it was the first shuttle that blew up. Sure. And uh, interesting things like that had happened. But I went on to do Saturday Morning Live with Bill Boggs a lot. I was on the last show he was on, actually, that he did. I was on there with my anti-crime stuff. Uh, Curtis Lee was on there with me. Lisa Sleva. I did another show with Lisa Sleva on Nine Broadcast Plaza on Channel 9, mm-hmm. which was ironic because I did a show with... Um, oh, I forget the. F- he's very, very well known today. He's a, a he's a, a news a newscaster that does many, many shows. God, I forget his name. But anyhow, I did about ten shows with them, and sure. then I did the one of the fa- my favorite was uh, Joe Franklin, the Joe Franklin show. Yeah, and Joe died. He's, he's dead now, but he would call me up on the phone, and we'd have a conversation on the phone. His o- I call his office, he would pick up the phone, oh, cool. and Joe helped a lot of people. I mean, Jay Giles Band, all those guys started with Joe Franklin's show. A lot of them did. The, the Stones, when they came here, went on the Joe Franklin show. He was one of those old-time guys. But the TV things were something that really built me uh, pretty much an enterprise in, its, in itself because, you know, I was on so many different TV shows at the and time. And the first one to really do yes. that. Yes, Good Morning America, Good Morning New York. I went out to, uh, they called me up and I did um, Alive and Well with Kathy Rigby out in uh, Marina Del Rey. Mm-hmm. I did a senior, I used to teach a lot of senior citizens and handicapped people. So I always did, I did a lot of handicap shows. It's on, they're on YouTube actually, a bunch okay. of them. Yeah. And then um, TV was something I really liked, but I also liked teaching disabled women and through my FUMA organization, raising money. I did the first, in 1989, I did the first East Coast Martial Art Pioneer Hall of Fame. No fanciness. I had people come do demos. I raised 2,000 pounds of food for the community food bank. Cool. And I had Peter, uh, Peter Urban there. I had, uh, oh, God. Um, I had Henry Cho. I had Pete Siringano, uh, Professor Visitation. I had all these different people that were pioneers on the East Coast. And it was the first award they ever got. They never got an award. They were very flattered that I asked them to come. I had around, I guess, 20 of them that I gave awards to. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Um, I did the, uh, I did the hall of fame. Who else was there? Oh God. I even had a few people from up in this area on there, but I, I had a tremendous amount of pioneers that, um, they got awards. Johnny cool was one of them. Um, oh geez. So many different people that I can't remember how, yeah. you know, the names. Well, but, there's been so many. It's, I mean, well, that was the first, it was the first hall of, of fame ever. That, that, really? That, that, it was the first Hall of Fame that we okay. that was ever done on the East Coast that was, you know, for the pioneers that started sure. all this stuff. Sure. Nobody ever honored them. I honored them because I had a magazine at that time, Karate International. That's my next phase is I started Karate International on my own with a, a woman, Gail Uhlenberg, a friend of mine that I met who uh, funded, was one of the people that funded it. And... Um, we started with, uh, you know, that, and I ended up merging with a huge company that owned 1920 magazines because oh. I got to the point where I didn't know whether, after the six issues, it was expensive. Yeah. You're talking about $35,000, $40,000 an issue. Yeah. And um, at that time, uh, I, I knew a bunch of people that owned magazines in a publishing company, mm-hmm. Carney Publishing, and they, I merged with them. They bought my magazine with me along in the package, and then we la- I lasted for another 11 years. Wow. So I went on to help a lot of people. It was the first full-color martial art magazine, actually, in the country. Did you enjoy doing that, the magazine stuff? I mean, if you did it for I did, I, close I, to 12 years. You know, what was great about the magazine was, it was help, I was able to help build my Action Film Academy, which I've been doing for 24 years. Yeah, that, 
Um, That's still going. Yep. You still and have still events. making movies. Mm-hmm. I just finished a movie. Bill Wallace is in it. I did a movie in 98 with Joe Lewis. Bill, uh, I had Joe Hess in it. I did it at Screen Gem Studios. Sean is in it. Terry's in it. All these guys were kids. They came to my Action Film Academy. I used everybody there in my movie. Cool. And I have, I have the cutoff. It's called the cutoff. And if you go into the cutoffmovie.com, you can see behind the scenes. Great oh, stuff. Oh, nice. But um, this here, now I'm doing this movie called The Operative, which is coming out unbelievable. So it, the magazine did help me get involved in the movie business because I ran the Action Film Academy. I started that Action Film Academy with Keith Strandberg, who wrote No Retreat, No Surrender, yep. Blood Moon, which I was in, uh, King of the Kickboxes, which I was in with Billy Blanks. I uh, had a big fight scene with him. So my career, you know, worked hand in hand. I was able to get yeah. out there and, and teach and do seminars and get out there, you know, help the people I wanted to help that never had that opportunity to be in magazines. So it was one of those things I always felt like can, I can give back with that. And it did last for quite a while. <clears throat> and what happened was somebody came to, I did a seminar in Virginia. And when I did the seminar in Virginia, I was really moving along with the magazine and the, my events. I, my martial university, I started down in karate at college where Jerry Beasley, I was, mm-hmm. I've been there. I'm actually headlining it this year, the 30 year anniversary with Bill Wallace, me and Bill Wallace, because you know, Joe's not here anymore, and right. the people do headlight it. So I'll be he, has, he has a lot of people there. So, But um, it's nice to be able to do that because Jerry called me. He said, 30-year anniversary. I've always helped Jerry, and I started the martial art university down there, my IFOJJ martial art university. With Jerry was there, and I had a whole bunch of people there. And it's been going ever since. I'm doing that October 7th over at the Doubletree Hotel in Fort Lee. Cool. I do that every year, my martial art university. But to make a long story short here, I ended up going, it's a pretty interesting career, because I ended up going to uh, Virginia doing a seminar, and a guy approaches me and says, listen, and this is going back in 90, you're talking about 95, 96. Right. Magazine was going strong, and this guy approached me and said, listen, I work for America Online on the lifestyle interest section, and I'm a martial artist. I'd love to be able to do something with you in the lifestyle and interest section. Mm of AOL. I knew nothing about it. I knew AOL, but I knew nothing about the internet. Very few people knew back then. Right. What year is this? 95. Okay. So Most people weren't online then. Nope. And AOL was the only baby in town. There was no other. Pretty much, yeah. Didn't yeah, have was, a Google. It, you didn't have any of them then. Right. They came later. So next thing I know, I had a contract. Well, his, the company AOL sent me a contract. I sent seven people to learn Rayman tools down to AOL, to the mm-hmm. offices, and I had the first martial art internet site in the world. That was a portal site. Oh, wow. Nobody else had a site back then. Nobody. It was the first martial art internet site ever in the history of the internet. And now, look at it. Yeah. So what happened was I ended up getting that going. I had, they, they, AOL was great. They get 50 free hours. They made a, a, a flyer for me to, and they gave 53 hours on a disc, mm-hmm. floppy disc, and put it, I polybagged it in my magazine. I was smart enough to do that. Okay. In fact, it was polybagged in a magazine where I had Texas Walker, Chuck, who's a friend of mine. I've known Chuck for years. I did a lot of interviews with Chuck, and he admired my father, and, and he's just a great, great, great human being. Yeah. And um, it was in that issue that I did the polybag with him on oh, the cover. Cool. So it worked out really well. And, um, that went on, and I had about 4,000 pages. I had a, a Gracie site on there because Gracie's were just getting big. They, they actually Back took, in the mid-90s, you were, they took you were out talking an about ad. the Gracie? They were the, really? Otomics took out an ad. Gracie's took out an ad. They were the ones paying. I mean, it was starting to roll along. Yeah. And it was the first time ever, you know, I had the magazine, so I knew a lot of advertisers. Right. And I was just starting to build that. So what happened was when I built that, it was, became very, very large. I mean, we had a lot of people on there. And this is something that very few people know, which is very interesting. I'm, I'm now get, I now get hired for the UFC. Mm-hmm. They hire me. They want me to be a judge and a commentator on the side. And uh, you can see it if you go into my deepesqualjujitsu.com. You'll see a little clip. Michael Deepesqual Jr., world-renowned jiu-jitsu expert and creator of America Online's Martial Art Worldwide Network. Well, I would sit, and I was the first one ever to do this. Ringside, I'd have Danny Lane... And Todd Perigo, one of his guys, who went to school to learn the Rainman tools, sitting ringside with a desktop computer. And AOL had chats. 
and we would do chats with, I have all the original chats. You should see them. Gracie. Yeah, I'd love to. Oh, it's unbelievable. Don Fry, uh, Shamrock, Severin, all of those chats. I'd sit him down ringside in between, you know, uh, or before or after, and they would sit and talk to the people at home ringside. Oh, cool. And this, and stuff, it, this stuff's online. It was online, not now, but it, uh, it was it, online. I'm, I'm going to hunt. I'm going to see yeah, if I can yeah, turn I see that up. Can, but you know what? It's kind of ironic because there was no laptops. There was no computers. Nobody was doing anything. So I get this brain idea when they start. And this is amazing because, uh, you know, I, I still look back and say, wow. The things that I, you know, that kind of innovated in a certain sense of yeah. the word. I see that they're banning the UFC everywhere. I get this bright idea. I go to this company called Nine Net Plaza over in Sea Caucus and see if I can stream into their satellite mm. and do a pay-per-view online. First one ever to do it. So really? what I do is I do, I say, okay, I talk to uh, uh, Morowitz who owned the UFC, a semaphore entertainment, and I'm mm -hmm. sitting there and I talk. He said, no problem. Let's see what we can do. I end up with about four or 500 people, you know, paying, paying like 12 bucks or whatever it was to download the, and not, I didn't know at that time what was going to happen. Right. So we end up putting a pay-per-view online because people all over the country couldn't really get this. And it was new. I promoted it through my internet, through the AOL, through my magazine. But, you know, you weren't going to get a lot of people that, because a lot of people did, at that time didn't have computers to download stuff. There was no way to do right. Only the ones that were savvy were able to do that. Right. Well, wouldn't you know, I got 400 people or so to do it. And it was, the, the, the event was in slow motion, like this. Right. Because the bandwidth wasn't the bandwidth big enough. Wasn't, it, the the and world then I wasn't ready. Wasn't ready. I was way ahead of myself. Yeah. And the only one that did that besides me, believe it or not, I, and I found this out, was Victoria's Secrets did a runway show. That's right. And they were doing a runway show, and, and it didn't work for them either. Yep. So it was kind of interesting to see that. And I knew where it was going. I said, wow, digitally speaking... Because I was, uh, my magazines were the first ones ever to be created on, on, on a computer. Black Belt Magazine and the rest of them still had their machines where they cut and paste, where they print out everything and they cut and paste it. Yep. And it cost them a lot of money. So they did not want to go to the, they didn't want to go to the computer and start doing that. I was sure. the first one to do that. It cost a fortune. Because right. I, when I first started my magazine, I was sending my magazine to China. To have the color separations done and have I, my, I had these guys, Asian guys in, from Gamington Graphics at the time mm -hmm. in, in Canal Street. I would go there and lay out my magazine with them on a computer. And it was a uh, Macintosh computer. Yep. It was amazing. It was the first of its kind. They were doing several magazines of their own, which um, were kind of like magazines that were, uh, how would you put it, exotic magazines in a certain sense? Sure, sure, <laughs> so, that's a good way to term it. And I, yeah, I, but, you know, I needed to get it done. They did a great job on it, and they would send it to China. This is what I went through. While I was doing seminars, teaching, had a school, I had several schools, and still doing a whole, I didn't sleep. I, I, I yeah. remember, because when I first did this, I, I, when I laid out my magazine, I had to go to an office and sleep overnight in the office to lay this out. <laughs> I never forgot, because I remember one time my guy in the beginning I went to Guccione's daughter's office, yeah. which was in Teaneck, and they had a layout guy there that was a friend of the guy that was my guy that was working, and we needed, we needed his equipment. Right. So we would go in there on a Friday when it was closed. I'd sleep there, lay it out Sunday, 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, be done with it, and leave there. It was, it was amazing, some of the things I did. But it's interesting enough, the... Um, the magazine that was, was laid out, I would send it to China. It cost me $5,000, $80 a page. Now you do it for nothing right. to color separate the, the ads and yep. stuff. So it was, it was costing me about 5000 I think, a magazine just to send it over there and get it back, wow. the proofs. So, you know, it was kind of an interesting. But the teaching end of it, you know, I, I've been teaching all over the world. I have four schools in Italy. Um, I go there all the time. Okay. Uh, I have schools... Spain, a few other places yep. that teach my stuff that came here. Um, I do seminars all over the country. I, right. You know, I, I'm obviously I, I also do certifications. That, you know, as you very well know, Brent, Chrissy. Yep. Uh, yeah, you're talking about a lot of the people that are here. Yeah. Uh, Terry Dow. Uh, a lot of a lot of Brent students at black belts of mine just did a testing over Buckland. there. Huh? Buckland. Buckland's another one of my black belts. Yep. But you know what? It's all about sharing. Anyhow, right. you share. You share the wealth. 
And you share the wealth of knowledge when it comes down to this. But, to, you know, the biggest thing now is I'm still, this movie I'm doing has, has Bill Wallace in it. That's great. I didn't, I didn't I show you. I thought he said he was never going to do another movie. I thought I heard him say that. So did that's you, awesome. Did I, show you the, did I show you the little clip? No. Let's, I'll show you now. Because what I did was I, it's not out, I don't show anybody this. Yeah. But I filmed, just to show him, I filmed on a, my iPad. On the computer, because right. it's a for a rough cut. Yeah, I filmed his scene, which he opens the movie. Cool. He opens the movie. He's not an. Hey, listen, he's on a movie set. My stunt camp's involved in it too. My son gets killed. You know, it's a great script. A guy, cool. uh, my director John Alferi, who's a writer primarily, wrote yep. this. It's unbelievable. Nice. Where I was, I was. Uh, I'm an ex CIA agent from 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and I put like three groups of people away back then. And my, and I'm on movie sets. I do. I run an action film academy for real, which I do for real, anyhow. Right. But I also do police defense attacks, this, that, and the other thing for a whole bunch of SWAT units, which I do as well. And um, he came up with this story where my son at the action film academy, a sniper comes and and he gets killed instead of me. Okay. And you can see it's a great scene, it's an unbelievable scene. And now I go back and look for these people that I put away, find out. If any one of these guys, who else would try to kill me and right. kill my son? Right. And then, in the, you know, in the beginning with Bill, I'm on a movie set with Bill. And Bill's doing his thing. Terry's in it, too. Cool. Yeah, I'm going to show it to you. But yeah, yeah. It's, it's, been a, it's been interesting. And my father was the one that really was an icon. Um, and I'll tell you another great story. In 1964, my father introduced martial arts at the World's Fair in Queens. Okay. He was the one that did the, he introduced it. And it had Moses Powell, Ronald Thunk, and all these guys. Uh, George uh, Cofield, George Chalian, uh, Rich Triani, all old pioneers. Yeah. And then in 1967, nobody knows this. Very few people know it. Paramount Pictures came to my father because of the World's Fair thing. And they, yeah. and they asked him if he'd be interested in doing a, a documentary on... I was in it. I was, I was about 12, 13 years old. A documentary on martial arts. First yeah. movie ever. Before Chuck, before Van Damme, before Seagal. It was the first movie in this country ever made that really was a, a, a movie slash documentary on martial arts. What was it called? Chop Chop. Chop Chop. Yep. Okay. You can find it probably on my site, on the Michael Deepest Crawl on Facebook. Yep. Chop Chop. Somewhere in there I have it up there. But it's a 10-minute documentary. Paramount Pictures produced it. Chris Shankle, who was a famous sportscaster, narrated it. And they built the dojo outside in the parking lot because they couldn't fit the camera. So they took three walls, took everything out of my father's dojo, looked like the dojo. And in the end, you can see my father breaking a brick and you look up and you can see the sky. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> but it was a documentary that uh, was the first martial art documentary slash movie ever made. Okay. I saw it when I was a kid with the Blue Max, yeah. which was George Papar was in the Blue Max. Yeah. Which is an old movie that you know he, that he made in '68, I think. But I remember going to the movie theater, and there it is. You know, the chop chop. It was a sports and action film. See, they used to make sports and action films right. back in the old days, where you right. would go and you'd see the Olympics. You'd see a 10-minute short documentary about sports and action, all about sports. And my and then my father happened to be the guy they picked to do that, and it was a very unique experience for me, because you know doing that with Paramount Pictures and a big crew and you know, it just amazed me. I mean, I have articles that they did in the newspaper with the big cameras, 35 millimeter. Later on, I went on to do my own movie with 35 millimeter cameras down at Screen Gem Studios where they made Ninja Turtles yep. and uh, they made Commando there. Yep. And we, and my guys, all my people, including Terry and the rest of them, they, um, they went on to do, uh, they fixed the whole back lot. Oh, neat. They, you know, the back lot was down. And it was used for a lot of different movies. Ninja Turtles, they made them all there. Crow, mm -hmm. the Crow was made there. Yep. And what happened was, they were, they, it was kind of not really in good shape. All my guys helped redo the whole back lot. Awesome. And then we went in, in, in the warehouse where I used the warehouse, where, where the, it's a big drug thing, with Keith Vitale was in it with me. Mm -hmm. Joe Hess and Joe Lewis starred in it with me. When uh, and you go into the, the cutoffmovie.com, you can see the, the trailer and a few other things. Okay. But what it is is, uh, I ended up having a drug thing where we had to build a drug set with all these, you know, all these wooden uh, crates and everything. Yeah. I got all the guys that you know. They said, "Listen, 
you guys need to help me. And they put it together for me, so I was able to get a lot of work done. You know, it was a movie that cost a lot more money than what it would cost today. Today, you can make a movie like that for like 200000 Sure. Back then, I, I think I spent 700000 me and my investor. So You had a lot of firsts. I mean, as, as you know, we go back over the last 25 minutes or so. I mean, it was just, it's, you know, first to do this and this and this. And, you know, if you were the first to do something once, maybe twice, we could chalk that up to luck. Yeah, Certainly you know, not luck. You have, you have a different perspective on what's going on. Like, how would you describe that? Is it, you know, are you just out of the box or, you know, are you, you able to see in the future? I don't know. It's kind of funny you say that. I just worked around the <laughs> clock and was motivated by what I felt I can do to help others as well. I don't know it was only um, martial arts was one thing because I was raised in a martial arts family. I was sure. raised with a pioneer and an icon in the martial arts, yeah. having to go to the dojo, and whether I liked it or not. Uh, but the other thing is just, for some strange reason, I was so over, overly motivated to do something that was, and probably because my father wanted me not to do it, <laughs> you know, uh, because he said, you're not going to make a living doing this, you got to go to college, you got to do this, you got to do that. I went to college for a year. And but I he got, was he was doing it. No, no. Full, my father was no, no. My father's full time job was he was a. My father was in the CID in World War II. My father had a big, big, big security company. My oh, father was people okay. don't know it. No, most martial sure people don't know that he was a counterterrorism expert. Seriously? Yeah, my father was a huge counterterrorism expert. He did. He had a. Wow. He did bomb lectures. My father, for huge corporations. And this and, is kind of back before, I mean, did that term even exist back then? I mean, terrorism. No. What happened was, I never, you know, what's kind of funny, in 1989, he did a bomb lecture at Lipton T. I have it okay. on tape. And then the newspaper, the, the Herald, came out. and My father said, and this is no lie, before the first World Trade got bombed, the first time, he said there's cells growing right now in, in the New York metropolitan area that are terrorism cells. Way before it started getting big like it is. It was there. But my father was one of the people that was literally a counterterrorism expert. And he did bomb lectures with all kinds of bombs that he had kits you can't imagine. Some of the stuff he talks about, you'd say, what? Wow. But he ended up doing lectures, and he was the first one ever to identify in a newspaper that, you know what, we better watch because this is what's going to happen in New York. Those cells are going to grow, and the ter terrorists are there. You just don't know it yet. And I have the article. It's a great article in the Herald. And uh, my father did used to write some terrorism articles for a terrorism magazine at the time. There was few of them, but he was. My father owned a huge security company. My father, okay. I, I, you, I worked for him. I did troubleshooting. Oh, I would go around be a security guard at Lipton T, at uh, Aurora Toys, at Lynnhurst Garbage Disposal, at the Paramus Park when they built it in the air and. BMW, B, uh, eight, uh, when they were building the corporate headquarters for Mercedes, I was sitting in a booth outside, you know, in the mud, having to do my <laughs> rounds for him because he had security guard. He was a big security company. And Fetter's Air Conditioning, which was huge, one of the biggest buildings, is now owned by, I think, the Times or the Daily News in Edison. But he, my father had, you know, and he, he putting in security. He also had a, a division that they put in uh, security for homes. Alarms. Yeah. He was one of the first to do that too. Oh, wow. But that was his main business. Okay. My father was first and foremost involved in that. Martial arts was strictly always something second. It was never first. He was big in it, but it was all, he, his security company was adjacent to the dojo. He had a big, big office on the side that was his for his security company. He, and he had probably all, up to 80 guards that would go out. So why was it second? Was it, was it, I mean, obviously he loved martial arts. I mean, it, because you know what, when he I mean, was, was 18, it? 19 years old, when he, he fought World War II, but he was, a, he was in the CID, Criminal Investigation Detachment. Okay. My father spoke five languages, so he oh, was okay. able to, you had to do that in order to be in the Criminal Investigation the Division of the Army. And he went to the Philippines, New Guinea, and security, and that is what started him. He got involved in that way before the martial arts, although martial arts he was doing too. I've got him pictures of him in boot camp. I got a picture of my father in the Philippines with kendo gear on, leaning against a palm tree. Yeah, he was in the Philippines with kendo. I have a picture of it. It's cool. unbelievable. He's leaning what on a tree. What year would that have been? Had to be 1940. 
three or four somewhere. Okay. I don't know. You know, when the war might have been forty two. Okay. When the war was, you know, not in the end. It was right, right in the middle of it, actually. Yeah. Where Japan obviously was, he was in there. I got pictures of him with the Japanese flag, with the rest of the guys, where they, you know, took took the Japanese over over there. Yeah. Some great stories. He never told me those stories till later on in life, but uh, there was a lot going on over there in the, in the Philippines. You know, uh, the thousand mile, whatever it was, a hundred mile walk that they made. Yeah. But you know, he was one of the people that was there when they um, took over, they took back the Philippines, basically when MacArthur did that. But he was in the CID, so his job was to. CID is when you're an army officer or you're in the army and you rape somebody that's there or whatever. There's, mm-hmm. um, you know, the criminal investigation detachment, which is my father, is security. That's that's his main thing. Keeping yeah. everybody accountable. Right. That's where. But you had to fight the war also. Sure. So you know what? When it came down to shooting and it came down to you know meeting up with the, you know, the Japanese at the time, and ironically, he was one of the first ones ever to have a Japanese. A federation involved in the United States that he was a representative for, ironically. Was that hard for him, you think? No. I think my father was a pretty open minded guy. I mean, the Hakuri organization, he was the first representative of that. I'm no longer um, affiliated with them because it's too much politics. Sure. I don't want to be bothered with the politics, you know, Korean and Japanese politics. They, they, there's a lot of money involved in what they do. Mm-hmm. You go to Japan to get a you know, and I'm not putting them down, but, you know, you charge way too much money to get a Manko Kai than Shihan or whatever, the high rank, and you're paying five, ten thousand. It's crazy. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're here, and there's got to be a, a balance to that. I understand it because it did come from there, and there are some good people, but you've got to have a balance when it comes down to that. Too many people want to get rank from overseas and this and the other thing when, you know, what well, is rank? Yeah. Rank is nothing. When you look at the big picture, you're a human being. If you want, you know, if you want to, you know, put a thing on the wall and that has a 10th degree black, well, that's fine. But, you know, it doesn't mean anything when it comes down to teaching, when it comes down to educating, when it comes down to who you are as a human being. What, come, what, what means a lot as a human being, as a martial artist, is how much can you give to other people? Are you willing to share? That's the most important part of martial arts, is meeting a family. My father always called it a brotherhood. He got all his, most of the friends he had when he was older or midlife, whatever, came from the martial arts yeah. because it's, it's a great family atmosphere. You know, you can let it go in many different directions, but the biggest thing is to make sure that you're grounded enough to recognize that you're sharing something special. Is that focus on rank that, I mean, it comes up a lot, comes up a lot on our show and, and with other people. Is that new? Or has that always been there? Nah, it's, it's been there for a long, long, long time. I had a lot of fun talking to Soke, and I hope you had fun listening. We are definitely going to have him back. I can't say when it'll be, though, for you know our full treatment, our Monday interview show. Look forward to that. Once that happens, we'll be linking wherever that is, whenever that is, from the show notes on this episode. Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Again, this is episode 183. I thank you for your time today. Hopefully you'll check out the website, maybe jump on the newsletter list or share this episode with a friend. Anything that you do to help us grow this show means more guests, bigger guests, more fun opportunities that we can bring to you and the show's growing. And thank you for that. We've got some great stuff in the works that I'll tell you about as they come up. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.